Um, I should, I should uh, supplement something to what uh, Beef said. Um, one is that um, he said seven pages. It's actually much more than that. There is a website which is maintained by uh, uh, a German uh, or Austrian uh, researcher, uh, which uh, is updating the bibliography. And uh, the, the number of titles is something like 350 or something like that. That's one thing I wanted to say. Two. Uh, Biff, for, for many people using Alex, Biff is the image of Alex, the, the you know, personalized image of Alex. And uh, many people refer to Biff as the god of Alex. <laughs> that says something about the way he handled the, uh, the customers. Thank you, Biff. <laughs> so, uh, there is a part of uh, functional equation theory which deals with the representation of abstract constraint. And I give you an example, um, which uh, is called in the, in the functional equation literature as the associativity equation. Associativity uh, is often um, represented by an operation, but in functional equation, it, it's a function, function of two variables. And uh, it turns out, interestingly, that this constraint is relevant to the geometry of the right triangles. So let's show that. So draw the triangle ABC, and uh, FXY represents the length of the hypotenuse of the triangle, and X and Y are the, the, the lengths of the, of the sides. Draw the perpendicular. Uh, to the plane of ABC at the point C, and the length of that segment, uh, CD, is Z. Now, because uh, CD is perpendicular to the plane of ABC, it's perpendicular to BC, so I can draw the, uh, the line BC and get another right triangle, and the length of the hypotenuse F FY, uh, FYZ. Now, uh, AB is, it's easy to see that AB must be perpendicular to BD. So if I now draw the line AD, uh, that line AD is the, the segment AD is actually the hypotenuse of two right triangles. And uh, if you look at uh, carefully at what they do, you, you see that uh, the, the length of that triangle uh, is, uh, t tells you that associativity is uh, satisfied. Now you may wonder, so the length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle is, is an associative function. Now you may uh, wonder why is that of some importance. So let's try to let's begin to be a little formal. I talk about associativity, but I didn't, uh, you know, say anything specifically. So uh, take uh, uh, J, a possibly infinite open interval, and uh, a real function from J cross J to J satisfies the associativity uh, equation, or equivalent to it is associative if the equation that you see in the board is satisfied. Lemma. And that's, uh, that lemma is in Axel's book. Uh, it's a standard uh, functional equation result. And so if uh, a function is associative and satisfy you know, the side condition, uh, uh, Axel writes uh, reducible on both sides. And you can carefully see what it means. In fact, uh, if you replace that by strictly monotonic, uh, you imply reducibility on both sides. Now, if that is satisfied, then there exists a function f, such that f of x, x, y is equal to f of f minus 1, the inverse of f, of x plus f minus 1, the inverse of y, 
Now you look at that and what do you see? This is a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. So that's interesting. Now, if you now require that that representation is meaningful, and I would say a little later exactly what I mean by that, then there is only one form possible for that function f, which is f of xy is equal to x to the power 1 over theta plus y to the power 1 over theta to the power theta. In other words, you got, I mean, uh, proof number 365 or something of the Pythagorean theorem. So uh, why that example? Because it really gives you an idea of what I have in mind. Now, I will tell you uh, in a little while, in a few slides uh, ahead, exactly what I mean by meaning, uh, meaningful. And uh, by now, you should know, uh, you should have a pretty intuitive idea of what meaningful is. But uh, in, in, in uh, the meaning that I will, uh, I will use, uh, I would say that it's meaningful if its mathematical form remain essentially the same under change of its ratio scale unit. So I'm being um, more precise, not more precise, more specific than Lewis is. Lewis' uh, definition of meaningfulness is much more general than that. Uh, but again, I will give you the exact definition in a little while. So to summarize, if you assume associativity, what you get out of it under, uh, you know, monotonicity condition is that f has that representation, which is right here. And if you pair that with meaningfulness, you obtain this form as the only one. And this is, of course, a generalization of the usual form of the Pythagorean theorem. Now, uh, there are other examples of uh, abstract constraint, and the examples that I will use uh, today are, you know, on the board. One is the permutability equation, and you look at it, uh, f of f of x y z is equal to f of f x z y. In other words, you can permute the last two terms, and nothing changes. Uh, the quasi permutability uh, equation is essentially the same thing, except that you're using a uh, subsidiary function g. Okay, so that's the second equation. It's quasi-permutable if there exists some g such that f of g x y z is equal to f of g x z y. And uh, translatable, the function f is translatable. If, again, you iterate, and then iterating it uh, is the same thing of, uh, as adding the last two terms, x and y. So, these are three examples of abstract constraint, and uh, in the functional equation literature, you can find other one. Now, the idea, of course, is to use these abstract constraints, which some of which are very intuitive, and then pair them with uh, meaningfulness, and then getting out of it the exact form up to some parameter, the exact form of possible scientific law. Why is that interesting? Because these abstract constraints, some of them are intuitive. Take, for example, the permutability uh, equation here, right? The first, uh, the first line. Uh, think of the y in the, uh, uh, the right-hand side of the first equation as modifying the state of x. So you have x meaning the states, y modifies it, and the result is f of x, y. Then you modify it again by z. It's as if you had two effects. You have the first one, which is y, the second one is z. It doesn't matter the order. The order doesn't matter. Okay, so that uh, is interesting because it's something that you can probably, in many situations, empirical situations, you can guess whether, you know, if you permute these two effects, it doesn't matter what they are. Uh, Bayes' theorem is an example of a permutable function, okay? And uh, this is what I just said. Okay, so let's, uh, 
Now, uh, the benefit of this ab abstract uh, constraint is that you have this representation. I already gave you the representation for uh, the uh, um, for the first uh, uh, constraint that I had. Now, the representation for the quasi permittability is given in the second line. If a function is quasi permittable, if f is quasi permittable with respect to g, then there exists f function m f and g such that f of x y can be written as a function of the sum of f x plus uh, g y. And g itself can be represented <coughs> by the same function f and g as indicated in the third line. And the translation equation, which is right here, gives you the, the representation f of f minus 1 of x plus y. So the general developmental scheme that I'm proposing to you, of which these are only three examples, is as follows. We take an abstract constraint, the type of abstract constraint that gives you good functional equation results. You get the, the, the representation via functional equation. You pair it with meaningfulness, and you get a, a scientific law. Why do I call it scientific? Because it's based on ratio scale. So it's a possible representation of a scientific phenomenon. <coughs> now, uh, meaningfulness. As I said before, the, uh, the meaningfulness condition that I will state uh, is um, more specific than, uh, than Lewis in, in two ways. One is restricted to ratio scales. In other words, you know, I'm focusing on basic physics. And two, I'm constraining the output. In the case of, of Lewis, uh, it's an if and only if, and the output results of, of the rest. In, in, in the, the definition that I will give you, the output will be specified uh, but fairly exactly in terms of the uh, transformation of the scale of the input. OK, that's the, uh, that's the, the difference. So let's uh, illustrate uh, the, uh, the meaningfulness condition um, starting from the usual form of a physical law called the Lorentz uh, Fitzgerald uh, contraction. And this, the, we have a function L. And it's a function of two variables, L and V. L is the length of a rod measured at rest. V is the speed of an observer who is moving on a line which is parallel to the rod. And uh, the result of that observation uh, of the speed v is that the rod is, the measure of the rod is shrinking, and is shrinking according to uh, the, uh, the formula uh, in the right uh, hand side. How now the I'm sorry? How do you measure the length of a rod? Oh, for, for example, you, you know, you, you send a piece of, uh, you, you send a, a light, and you send a light, and so where they do it. And you measure the time. Yeah. Um, the trouble with that notation is that it's very ambiguous. If you don't give the, uh, the units of the two scale, you don't really know what you're talking about, OK? And, uh, you know, for example, writing L of 73 has no meaning except you don't, if uh, you don't specify, for example, that uh, 70 means 70 meters and uh, 3 means 3 kilometers per second, uh, respectively. Now, such parenthetical reference is standard in, uh, in, uh, you know, in science but it's not useful for us because we want to express an invariance. And in mathematics, usually when you want to state that something is variant, invariant with respect to something else, the thing that is supposed to be invariant about should be in your notation, not implicitly, not, you know, not given implicitly. Okay, so we, we have to make the notation a little more uh, complicated than that. 
And so wha what uh, all of this, by the way, I should specify, originated with that paper with Lewis in 18, uh, 1983. Um, so what I will do is regard L of LV, which is the notation addressed before, as really meaning uh, that it's measured in, in basic anchor initial units. So it's as if the L was really a shorthand for L11. Okay? If you change uh, units, instead of L11, you're going to get something else. L alpha beta, for example. So if you, uh, if you change the unit, you're going to multiply, uh, this amounts to multiply L and V in the pair LV by constant uh, alpha, positive constant alpha and beta. And the function L, which is also a length, is also multiplied by alpha. And uh, the implication is that uh, if the new units are kilometers and meter per second, then the two expressions that you, that you have uh, right there, actually, even though they are numerically different, they represent the same phenomena. And this points to what we should have as an appropriate definition for L of alpha beta it should be the first equation that you have on, on the board. So it's L of alpha beta LV should be equal to what you see. And the only difference is that uh, the speed of light C, I should have told you that before, that C would represent the speed of light, is multiplied by beta. And the connection between L, or L11, and L of alpha beta is what you see, actually, why don't you go directly? So this is your first example of a meaningfulness equation. Now, the definition that I will give you uh, is, uh, is a little bit complicated, because I have decided to give you the, the general definition. The reason why I, I did that is that if I didn't do it, then somebody would have asked you, what happened if and then I would have given the explanation. So suffer with me for a few slides, because it gets a little, a, a little complicated. Why does it uh, get complicated? Because what you have to do is you have to, um, to, to, to look at all the possible, if you if you're a function of n variables, you have to look at all the possible transformation, uh, change of scale. And then these change of scales have to be reflected in the output. OK? So that makes your life a little bit difficult. But that's the difference. Uh, between the definition that I will give you and the definition that Lewis and I were using in 19, uh, our, our paper in 1983. And I do that because I need it. And you might say, well, you know, you, you're making our life so complicated. You know, what's the, the, the deal? The point is that this very complex notation is temporary. You use it to get the juice out of it. To, to get the juice out of meaningful life. Once you have done it, you can drop the complicated notation and use the standard notation. So uh, that was mentioned by Fred this morning. Uh, there is a notion of a, uh, of a code, a numerical code. It's a function of n variable. And j1, jn, and jn plus 1 are uh, uh, non-negative uh, interval, and it, they may be of, uh, of infinite length. And the, uh, the function f is assumed to be strictly monotonic and continuous in its end argument, and strictly increasing in its first argument. And uh, the, wh what I will use in, you know, when I start uh, giving you example of what we get out of meaningfulness, I use the case of a two code in which, which are a function of, of two variables. One uh, important definition is uh, the notion of uh, solvability. A two code or a code 
is solvable if it satisfies the, the two conditions S1 and S2. And you see what they mean. If f of xt is smaller than p, then you can replace x by w, some w exists, and then you get your equality. Okay? That's one aspect of uh, solvability. And the other uh, uh, aspect uh, deals with this, the, the other variable. And uh, function f is one point right solvable if there exists uh, x0 in the first argument uh, such that for every p you can find a v and get the equality. Okay, so uh, the left solvability and the right solvability are not are not identical, right? And these uh, these point uh, w and v that we say exist are unique. Two functions are f and g are of two variables are co-monotonic is the order for the same, uh, you know, uh, value of the variable is the same, in which case there is always a function m that you can, uh, that you can use to relate the two, okay? So, uh, co-monotonicity. All right, let's introduce the, the scales now. That's also something that uh, uh, Fred mentioned this morning. We have a collection F, uh, which contains function indexed by alpha, and alpha is a vector of, uh, of number, and these numbers represent change of scale, or actually the scale used for the, for the n variables, okay? And the, for the initial code, uh, the, the value of the alpha 1, alpha n uh, are equal to 1. And here is meaningfulness. So be prepared. So we delta 1 to delta n is a finite sequence of rational one. The collection of code is delta 1, delta n meaningful if for any vector x1 to xn, and, and this is, this, this, these are the, uh, the, the, the arguments of the function, and any pairs of vector, alpha and mu, and alpha and mu represent two possible assignment change of scale of units, okay? You have the, uh, the equation, uh, the, the equation there. And the, the exponent delta 1, delta n, uh, they depend upon the form of uh, <coughs> the form of the function. For example, for the, the Pythagorean theorem, it's going to be uh, 1 over alpha times alpha because the alpha is, uh, you, you know, is, is happening in the two variables. Okay, so you get, you get a square there. Now, in the case in which the, the output scale is the same as the scale of the first variable in the input, the equation that you get uh, is the last one. Last one here, which is the same form that we obtained for the Lorentz Fitzgerald uh, contraction. So the scale of f is the scale uh, uh, of the first variable. And this is the domain. I specif uh, you know, th this specifies the domain of f of alpha. And of course, all the intervals that I had at the origin have to be uh, extended or shrink by, by the change of scale. Now, I mentioned a, a, minute, a minute ago that uh, I, I will deal, that, that the example of the Lorentz Fitzgerald tr uh, translation, the scale of the output is the same as the, the, the scale of uh, the, the, the first variable. Uh, I give a name to that, which may not be the ideal name, 
I call it self-performing, right? So remember, when I say something is self-performing, that means that the scale is the same. The scale of the output is the same on the scale of me. And, um, and the, uh, the, the example that I will give, a concrete example uh, that I will give, will be example of self-performing. Um, family. So self-transforming connection, meaningful. Then the meaningful, uh, uh, the meaningfulness equation simplifies into the equation that you see there. Okay, let's uh, skip that. Okay, I'll give you examples. We already saw the example of the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction, and here is the example of uh, Beer's law. And that's a class of situation when you have uh, a radiation, and the radiation is uh, uh, traversed in some absorbing medium, and there is the resistance of the medium, so, uh, you know, the, the, what the uh, the intensity of the radiation that gets out is, is decreased, and the equation uh, that uh, describes that is, is here, right? X uh, times E to the power minus Y divided by C, and C is the reference level. So X is the intensity of the in incident light, Y the concentration of the absorbing medium, and C is the reference level. So that's the uh, uh, that, that be as law, and uh, the meaningfulness uh, is expressed by uh, by the equation, <coughs> uh, which is uh, right uh, right there. The volume of a cylinder. You have one. The, the so uh, you have a collection of code. Uh, C. Alpha, alpha is the same for all dimensions, right? Uh, for uh, you know, for, for the uh, uh, for the circle, for the diameter, for the for the height, and uh, the the meaningful equation is right here, one over alpha three, alpha l pi, alpha r to the square, and that gives you alpha pi r square. Okay. So uh, let's describe, it's going to be more fun now, you know, I guarantee it. Uh, let's describe uh, in more detail what I meant by uh, permittability and qu quasi-permittability. So a code F is quasi-permutable if there exists a function g such that f of g x y z is equal to f of g x z y. We then say that f is permutable with respect to g or g permutable. When f is permutable with respect to itself, we simply say that f is permutable and that is coming straight from uh, Axel's book. And here is a lemma, also straight from Axel. So you have a code F. Uh, we assume it is solvable. And it's quasi-permutable if there exists three functions, M, F, and G, such that you have the first red equation. A solvable code is permutable if and only if there exists f and g such that, and you have the second equation. And if you have symmetry, in addition, uh, so you have permittability and symmetry, if and only if you have the last equation. Translation. So a code satisfies the translation equation, or is trans uh, translatable, if and only if you have the first equation. And you can sh easily show that Beer's law is translatable.
And here is the lemma for uh, the translation equation. So code is translatable if and only if there exists f, such that f of x, y is equal to f of f minus 1, x plus y. And then, uh, you know, you have two cases uh, depending on uh, what kind of uh, range uh, you have for the first interval uh, j, uh, which is also the interval of the output. Now, here's one thing again out of meaningfulness. If you have a collection of codes, okay, which is meaningful, then if one of the codes satisfy property, then all of them do. Not all property, but the property which are listed here. So some code F is solvable, some code F is differentiable into variable, quasi-permutable, symmetric, then all the codes must satisfy that property. Moreover, uh, if the initial code is solvable and permutable, just one code, right? Then for any code, you have that formula. F of mu nu xr is equal to mu to the delta, v to, uh, nu to the delta, f minus 1, f of x divided by mu plus g r divided by theta. So that's one example of propagation of properties via meaningfulness. Here's another one. So you have a meaningful collection of uh, self-transforming collection of uh, code. And suppose that one code is translatable, or one code is symmetric, or one code is permutable then all the codes satisfy that property. And finally, our first uh, theorem. How am I going time-wise? We'll uh, so 2.5, so. 2.45, okay. So he, here's the first theorem. So we assume meaningfulness. We assume solvability symmetry and associativity. Then there must be some positive constant, theta, such that f of alpha is equal to x theta plus y theta to the power of 1 over 1. So let's prove that. It's important to prove it because the, me the mechanics of the proof are really the same for you know, almost all the theorem, as far as I can tell. So it's, it's, it's interesting. So I assume that the code which is solvable, strictly increasing in both variables, symmetric, etc., is the initial code. Uh, I can assume that without loss of generality. doesn't matter which one, but I, I'm assuming that, uh, that it's that one. From our previous lemma, we know that for <coughs> any code, I must have that representation. Sorry. Right? You remember, we, uh, if, uh, if one code is uh, uh, solvable, uh, symmetric, associative, then all the codes are. That means that for all these codes, I have that representation. Now, by meaningfulness, my meaningfulness equation is right here. Right? F of alpha alpha x, alpha y, equal alpha f of x, y. And so if I replace the two sides of that equation by the representation to above f, I have that. Right? F of alpha, I, I have this equation here. This guy is <coughs> very friendly. Right? Now, I apply uh, f alpha, f minus 1 alpha on both sides. And then you look at that equation carefully. And what should you, uh, what should you be think about, thinking about at this time? Cauchy, 
right? Because on the <coughs> right hand side you have f minus one x plus f minus one y. Okay, well, so let's transform it. Let's call f minus one x by z, f minus one uh, x by w, and then you have f alpha minus one alpha f. Let's call that g alpha. You do the same thing on the other side and you obtain the equation right here. So that's a Cauchy equation, and uh, since g of alpha is strictly increasing, you know what that solution is. It has to be of the form g alpha z equals c alpha z. And z, remember what z is. z is f minus 1 of x right here, right? So this is what you get. You get a multiplicative, the last equation of, of the, of the uh, of the page, you get a multiplicative Pexider equation. Now, let's assume that f alpha minus one of alpha x is monotonic increasing in alpha. That's an assumption. Then if it's true, then the Pexider equation has its usual uh, solution, which is a power. So f of x is a power. Uh, c of alpha is equal to mu alpha to the power uh, eta for some eta. And f alpha of x is equal to mu mu x alpha. Now, you work things out, and you end up with uh, f of x y is equal to x to the theta plus y to the theta to the power one uh, over alpha. However, remember I ha I have assumed that f minus one alpha of alpha x was monotonic with respect to alpha. Okay, I still have to show that, right? But because f of alpha alpha x alpha y is equal to alpha f of x, y, the, 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 the left-hand side of the first equation is monotonic in alpha. Now, if we uh, apply f minus 1 on both sides, it remains, because uh, f minus 1 of alpha is mono monotonic, it remains monotonic with respect to alpha. Okay? And that implies, indeed, that f of alpha x plus f minus 1 of alpha x plus f minus 1 of alpha y uh, has the representation which is given here, namely f of alpha x y is equal to uh, x theta plus y theta to the minus 1. This is one theorem. Uh, I have other theorems, I'm not sure I'm going to prove them, but they, they really work the same way. In other words, you you use, the, you use the representation coming from functional equations, you use meaningfulness, that gives you one, equ one equation, then you work on that equation, and then you get your solution using functional equation arguments. So here is the uh, quasi permutability theorem. Uh, so you assume that you have a collection f of alpha beta, which is uh, meaningful, uh, self-transforming, and you assume that one code is solvable, strictly increasing both variable and permutable with respect to the initial code, then the initial code must have the form of uh, equation two, namely it <coughs> must uh, it, uh, it must be uh, a, a product of x and r to some power. And that's for the initial code. For f of alpha beta, it has to have the, the sucker. And uh, I'm going to skip that. It's essentially the same proof. And for the uh, translatability, what I have is, uh, is a conjecture. In other words, if I assume that, uh, if, yeah, if I assume to summarize, if I assume translatability, I essentially, as one case, I get uh, Beer's law. 
but uh, it looks like case two is also a, a solution, but I don't have that proof. In other words, I have, you know, my proof stopped at the point in which I, uh, I derive uh, the form of Beer's law, but. Uh, And I end up with an open problem to show you that we can extend all this, right? So take uh, an open interval, 0c, and consider the two axioms below which constrain a function which is defined on the Cartesian product of the positive real by the, uh, uh, the half uh, open interval 0c and here's what I'm assuming uh, I'm taking an operation uh, which uh, let's call it O plus and O plus is defined on 0c cross 0c to 0c and I'm assuming that uh, if we Think about uh, O plus as, as being the addition of relativistic velocities, okay? So adding two velocities has the same effect as iterating the function L. So that's one axiom. And the other axiom is that uh, adding, from the standpoint of uh, adding relativistic velocity, W on both sides, uh, doesn't change the order. Okay? So these are the axioms that I'm giving you, and we have to find uh, a representation. However, Jean-Paul and I already made some progress. Namely, here's the, the result that we got. So uh, it's uh, in the form of a lemma, which is, uh, and the lemma uh, is expressed in terms of uh, two representation for the function L and the operation. And so, you know, the first representation, DE dagger, is that, uh, you know, it's uh, some function lambda times uh, C minus U of V divided by C plus plus U of V to some power. And then the, uh, uh, the sum of, of V and W is equal to u minus one u of v plus u of w, etc., etc. And if you if you if you look at this carefully, you realize that a v dagger is a generalization of uh, the addition of relativistic velocities. Okay. So what we put our lemma, uh, which was fairly recent, uh, published in uh, Equation as Mathematica. So. Suppose that uh, the, the, the axioms that uh, I, I gave you are, are satisfied, then here's what you get. The two, well, let's go back to, so that you remember what I'm talking about. R and M. R and M are these two properties of uh, N and all of. Okay. So R and M are equivalent. And either of them implies the two representation in terms of the function u, which, which are these guys. Okay? So the open problem is uh, add meaningfulness to that and get the form of u. That must be possible using the same kind of trick as the one I've been uh, uh, using before. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>
if I remember, you can replace monotonic uh, monoton by, by continuity at one point. At one point, exactly, yeah. Right. So you, you can... Uh, you can so so that, that's weakening, but then also uh, there is a control more or less on the solution of phi equation when you don't put that assumption. So it could be interesting maybe to see what other operations are associative than... Uh, what what you do you get if you weaken it? I know. Uh, your encode uh, that you had there is a condition that's very close to saying that these function must be homogeneous of a certain type. Yes. And then when you throw the monotonicity, uh, that restricts the, strongly restricts which homogeneous functions you can have. Am I correct in that reasoning? Yes. Yeah, okay. Because, uh, you know, you have your conditions and you have the delta one, delta two, and you're taking the alpha out and it's one over alpha, delta one, one over alpha, delta two, et cetera, alpha two, delta two, et cetera, when you write the condition. Yeah which is the condition for a homogeneous function of several variables. Uh, and uh, but there, you can have a wide, wide class of homogeneous functions that can be quite ugly. And uh, so, uh, so, but the monotonicity, uh, no, but, 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 but the monotonicity the seems to, uh, well, the meaningfulness you, you're, you're throwing inside there, yeah. and the monotonicity, and that seems to, uh, Restrict the uh, uh, class of, the, of these homogeneous functions far more uh, rigorously than I would have thought. Especially its uh, meaningfulness in terms yeah. of ratio scale. Yeah, no, no, I, I understand that. Uh, I understand that. That's very powerful. Now, uh, it's quite possible that these developments would work with uh, reducible scale too, but I haven't looked at it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Duncan Luce was quite interested in uh, the relativistic velocity formula. Yeah. Because of possible applications to psychophysics, where we get sort of like a maximum brightness or a maximum yes. amount yes. of loudness, and also utility theory, yeah. where you have sort of like a maximum upper limit that you yeah. sort of go into value. Have you thought of applying <coughs> these no. things to those no. heavy no. ideas? <laughs> no. Well, from what he wrote there, and what he does is he has C being. Uh, limits and things like this from some of this presentation, it sounds like it's a doable project. Yeah. Particularly if you throw in certain types of meaningfulness. Yeah. So, a couple of questions I wrote down. So, when you define uh, delta 1 up to delta n uh, meaningfulness, you restricted the deltas to be rational numbers. So yes. What's, what was the rationale? <laughs> <laughs> No, was the, Lewis would ask about the answer of choice. <laughs> well, that was, a, that was a poorly educated guess. I can answer that a little bit. If you have the rationals and you get these exponents, the thetas that he has there, yes. they're rational, you can multiply them out to get integers. I go by on both sides. And so uh, the question is why should we look at integral powers rather than uh, real powers? And there's no good answer to that. Except in physics, only integral powers appear. Well, the other answer is too, the irrational, and, you, and, you, and these numbers, right, functions right here, are extendable to complex variables. And then you're going to have an infinite free mind on surface running around. Okay. So you're going to run out with more complexities. Okay. The people who claim that they're power laws in social networks, uh, which I'm not one, say, also say that the key has rational powers there. They correspond to separate dimensions. So what, what I really liked about this, was, it's such a nice generalization of, what, of Duncan's original uh, you know, ideas. Uh, one of the things that it would be really interesting would be to find other examples of laws that fit some of these abstract uh, forms that you've found. Yes. And I, and, uh, you know, I mean, my, my, uh, my thought was that if we, if we put the, the, the functional equation is on this, they might generate other examples yes. that might be useful. So uh, th there, is, <coughs> there is work for more than one person. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's unfortunate. Right. 
Any other comments or discussion? Uh, I had asked, would a uh, um, universal law of gravitation be meaningful? Uh, M, M, F equals M, uh, M times M divided by R squared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't say that. Okay, well, thank you again. Thanks.